Oh, we have two attendees. Oh. <clears throat> we have to allow them to talk. Oh. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi, how's it going? Hi, how's it going? I'm good, how are you? Good, thanks. <laughs> Is it just me here? Uh, there's one more. One more. Okay. And, uh, we have about 10 people signed up, so. Awesome. I mean, I'd be okay if it was just me. Yeah. <laughs> we one on one. one. <laughs> we only just realized now that we had to, yeah, we had to allow you to talk. Oh, oh that's probably, yeah. Sometimes people leave the, the mic on and you don't want them to. <laughs> So we'll give a few more minutes to see if some other folks will chime in, uh, join us, and then we'll just take off since we only have a half hour. Sounds good. <clears throat> Oh, I don't, yeah, I wonder, I wonder if there's a way to just let everybody talk instead of having to do that, but. Hello. Hi. Um, hi, it's Jade. Hi, Jade. Stepped in on your spotlight on safety. <laughs> awesome, welcome. Thanks. Hey, Jade. Hey. I'm going to wait for a few more minutes to see if anyone else joins us, and then we'll hit the ground running. There's a dog in your room. Where'd that yeah. dog come from? Very cute. <laughs> She's not real, but... <laughs> oh. <laughs> going to mute myself, I think. Okay. Can you guys see how many people are um, signed in to the chat now? Yeah, right now it looks like there's just three. So we have 10 people potentially joining us. Mm -hmm. So we won't wait forever, but we'll just give it a few more minutes. It's already five Ooh. after. All right. I wonder if folks are on computers or are they talking over the phone? I don't know. I hope they can see you. <laughs> well, why don't we just start having this conversation? We only have about a half an hour, so I'm assuming everybody can hear us. Um, and hopefully you guys can see us as well, because we want to show you a few things at the end. But we wanted to have this opportunity to get together, um, not just to share what it is specifically that we do with regards to emergency response, although we want to be able to have an opportunity to show you that as well, but also to hear a little bit about where folks are at. Um, it's not something that people are often just reaching out to us for. So we assume that most folks, and we've run into this, have something in place they're working with that they consider their emergency response procedures. Um, oftentimes when we've gone and looked at that stuff, it's far short of what we would recommend, but without an emergency presenting itself, they usually don't see themselves as having, as being deficient um, in, in that regard. So we figured we'd get some folks together and hear where you guys were at, what you have, if you have anything in place, where you got it from, what it looks like, who knows it's there, who has access to it, when was the last time it was refreshed or looked at, how relevant is it really, what procedures, what emergencies is it covering? I mean, um, use I it. tell you a little bit about where we come from on that as well. Paul, you're gonna say something? <laughs> well, it's also, uh, if, have you had to use any of your emergency uh, procedures or have any emergencies come up in the last little bit um, where 
um, you've had to re reference that or wish you had something that you didn't have, you know. Um, so anybody feel free to chime in if they have something, but. Um, There's also the chat little feature on this. If you're on your computer, you can click on chat at the bottom, little thought bubble with three dots in it. We can see that if you have anything to chime in on there. I will say this, that luckily most folks don't have to go to their emergency response procedures very often. Um, there's only a few emergencies that tend to come up more than others. Um, and generally speaking, the first thing people will do is if it's a major emergency, let's say like a metal, medical emergency or a fire emergency, they'll call 911, which would be the first thing on your emergency response procedure regardless anyway. Or an alarm went off if that were the case in that regard. Maybe there's a power outage, maybe there's a refrigeration failure, maybe the person directly responsible for that knows how to respond already. Maybe they have a procedure that they use and go to, maybe they don't, maybe they just sort of figure it out on the fly. Um, the way we come at it is that we recommend having procedures in place, written and codified and refreshed regularly so that assuming that person's not there or somebody is at a loss for what to do, it's already been vetted and written out for them. And anybody in your store theoretically could go and follow the instructions step by step. Certain ones will always start and end with calling 911, you know, and, and not dealing with it too front forward. Other things you might be able to deal with on your own, but you'll want to know how and what the procedure is, who to contact, things like that. So when we think about emergency response procedures, we're not even, we're not just thinking about the procedure itself, but emergency service contacts, um, internal contact lists, you know, who needs to know when they need to know um, what's going on, how to document a situation or an, or an incident, um, who gets that documentation, who does that documentation, how do you work with the customers in the store? Um, if a customer's involved, we're keeping customers away. Um, and what, you know, all those things are part and parcel of what your emergency response procedures would look like. Yeah, and I, um, you know, about probably 12, almost 13 years ago, I started it at City Market in Burlington. And when I came into that store, um, I noticed that there was a, there was, a lot missing in regards to emergency response. Employees and managers didn't really know how to respond to certain things that came up. And just like anywhere else, you know, those, those frequent things that came up were, you know, stuff like your staff itself getting hurt. You know, it's just small workplace injuries or even, you know, more major workplace injuries. Uh, but your customers having slips and falls um, and, and really understanding how to deal with those, those things and also like who to call and when to call and how to um, really finalize that process. And having everybody on the same page because in a medical emergency, there's a lot that people have to, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that people need to do. And so having everybody on that same page really made all these processes a lot smoother. So when I got there, when I got to City Market, I noticed that, like I said, they didn't have much. They had a few things and what they did have were kind of spread out. They weren't put together. They were uh, sort of some, they had like a couple forms printed, but then we had every, everything sort of on the computer drives, uh, but not really branded, not really together, not really uni uniform. Um, one thing that they did have pretty uniform actually was a fire response. And my, uh, I suspect for that is because Burling, uh, City Market's two blocks from the fire department the fire department would come by from time to time to do their inspections. And during one of those inspections, I'm sure that they uh, told the management there that, hey, you need this written procedure and you need uh, steps on how to handle the alarm and also the alarm panel and who's in charge of that whole process. So they had a pretty good fire one put together, um, but really nothing else. Uh, the other things that would happen uh, pretty frequently were something like a lost child. Um, even though it was, a, it was a small store, 12,000 square feet, retail, you know, we still got calls that a parent, you couldn't locate their child. So, you know, it was figuring out what were the most common things to happen in the store and some other uncommon things that could be pretty, uh, you know, pretty big. And then, and then really try to figure out how to respond to those issues. And so like I do in my personal life, which I don't, don't recommend for anybody, 
but I think about all the worst things that could possibly happen to me, and then I make plans to make to to figure out how to do that so it's uh so uh, how to fix those things so those things don't happen. So that's where we came up with the emergency response binder. So I laid out. Um, I'm going to move my con table of contents. Oh, that's not it. Uh, move over my table of contents so everybody can see this. There is a question there, Mike. I don't know if you see that in the chat. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of thought about what what kind of things would come up, what kind of things would we face at the store on a day-to-day -day basis. So I made basically a table of contents of all the different emergencies. Um, that might come up and then i began um really building out those emergencies i don't know i'm hoping everybody can kind of see the the table of contents here but there are quite a few things that you know do come up in our stores that we want to be prepared for um you know even something as trivial as an animal bite a dog biting somebody out front we really sh yes that is a medical situation but also certain you know, depending on where you uh, where your store is located, your uh, municipalities might require that all dog bite bites be reported, such as the case was in, in Burlington, Vermont. Um, Burlington, we got blizzards and severe winter storms. Uh, we have uh, everybody has bloodborne pathogens threats. Um, you know, you you may face things like floods or or everybody you know who has a prepared foods department may uh, have a risk of foodborne illness. So. Things like that, recalls, how to deal with your recalls. You know, and I'll, I'll say that when I first put out the emergency response binder at City Market, I actually didn't include uh, very much in the way of recalls until that big, um, I believe it was peanut butter recall that was out there. I believe it was peanut butter. And it was about, I don't know, like eight years ago. It was a very big recall. And based off of that recall, we figured out that our procedures were deficient and how to respond to that and how to document that um, appropriately. So we built out um, a recall procedure that was only one page um, because we were looking at recall procedures that were about five pages and that just wasn't going to work for us. So in building it out, and I'm moving over to my screen here. Um, sorry, it's a little bright, but the, uh, the cover, <laughs> when you print it out, doesn't, doesn't look as bright as it does on the screen. But in addition to the emergency response procedures, I also thought it was important to, how could we notify everybody in the store that there was an emergency going on and we could get as much response as possible to that emergency. Um, so I developed the emergency paging codes. Um, four different codes for the four, four different, um, you know, big emergencies that could come up, two of them pretty frequent. Store security emergency, not so much, but still good to have in case. Um, and then I'm just going to scroll through here for a little bit, showing that in addition to the emergency procedures, right there in the front cover of the binder, you know, we have emergency contact information for our utility contacts, but also our service technicians. Um, you know, we might need to get our, you know, HVAC tech out because our, our heat's down when it's, uh, you know, 10 degrees outside. So that's obviously something that if I wasn't at the store, you know, the front end uh, customer service desk person uh, we'll be able to contact the HVAC company and then we can get that repair going. So you don't have to wait for the one person, you know, who everybody looks to as that resource. The emergency response finder is your go-to resource that's always there, it's always on time, and you can always reference it. Um, in addition to that, you know, where do you put these things? How many do you have? Um, even for a small store like City Market, which has 12,000 square feet retail, I still had about 10 of these binders around. I had one in every single department so that any employee could grab this and have immediate, um, and can I have immediate uh, resource on how to respond to these things. So just quickly scrolling through, you can see some of the topics that we have um, and how it's sort of laid out. And I'm just gonna kind of go down to, I'm gonna scroll down to power failure because for whatever reason at city market we had a lot of power failures and that was one that was uh one of our most frequent and so we had to really get really good detailed procedures so every department knew how to respond to these um and just scrolling down i have it all organized alphabetically so it's easy to find and in the physical binder um which i'll show you in just a minute there's separate tabs 
um, so you can quickly reference the, the topic that you're looking for. So when I developed power failure, I knew that every department needed to be involved. Whether you're in food service, you had certain things you needed to do in that department. If you were in grocery, you had certain things you needed to do there. And obviously in the front end, we had certain things we needed to do there. So had to have procedures written first and foremost on how to really diagnose what was, what was going on with your power situation and then how to resolve that. And then we treat every power failure as if it's a catastrophic failure and it will be out for at least you know, a couple hours. Um, and as long as you treat it that way, your response is gonna be very, very similar. If power comes on quicker, great. If it comes on later, then we're prepared. Um, but every department ends up having um, different procedures to get started in the immediate response. So grocery, food service, support staff, maintenance, if you have it, front end, it's all kind of laid out there. And there's things that need to be done for IT, so think about that. There's things to be done after the power returns, so think about that. So the power failure one, the reason why I singled that one out is because it does illustrate that you do have to think about the big picture. You have to think about it globally on the response to these issues. We might have to call IT, we might have to call the store manager. So having those calling trees, which I have um, you know, listed right here in the, in the front cover, will help your employees on know who to call and when to call them. So I just wanted to chime in here while Paul's cycling through this. Um, we wanted to share you know, what we've put together. This is the emergency response binder um, for the store where Paul is currently working uh, in Sacramento that is the culmination of a lot of years of work for us in sort of dialing in the best tool that we could put together. Uh, when Paul was at City Market, as he said, it took him a while to work through each of these incidents and to come up with the most effective procedure, the best layout for it, um, and overall the best product that could be most useful in his store. Uh, that was some eight years ago now, or better, and we've sort of dialed that in over the years to something that we feel like is, we can be really happy with. Um, as he said, each one of these took him a while to put together, and it's a work in progress. It's always in a work in progress. When one of these comes up, if it gets used, um, we'll revisit it, see how it's working, see if it needs updating. Some of these things we've shrunk down a lot. Um, we've had advice from other folks too, where the, maybe the procedure's way too detailed. Uh, we wanna bring it, dial it in a little bit so it's easier for people to really be accessible um, to everybody. Um, you could find a lot of templates out there, but I encourage everybody when you're going through stuff like that to really narrow it down to your store, very specific, get very specific to what you need to do um, and really set aside the time and dedicate time, if not daily, but weekly to really work on this. If you're trying to tackle something like this in-house, I will say when I did this at City Market, it took me uh, six months to a year to really get this thing dialed in to even want to, to to a draft version to even start printing out so you and that's on top of you know obviously all the other responsibilities that we all have on a day-to-day -day basis so when you're thinking about putting something like this together really make really understand the time commitment it takes to do this and the reason why when i got to city market there really wasn't anything in place because nobody was really tasked with that as their focus as their main goal they didn't set that as a goal they didn't set that as a, a as an end result um and they it was just sort of like i will i'll do this when i have time and then five years pass and you don't have anything done and i've seen that so that's why i've said that but um so we have a few more folks that joined us um thanks for coming coming in and we don't have a whole lot of time for this you know it was going to be a really kind of a brief thing um as we started out uh, we wanted to hear from you guys where you were at, but we're just going to assume that you all have different stuff. We heard from one person, Hannah chimed in and asked us, um, I'm just going to read the question. She said she was interested in our recommendation for frequency of trainings on security practices and the best way to deliver that info. Um, one thing I wanted to say was that, let's say you do give yourself, you know, six months to a year and you build one of these in-house. Um, great. You have a collection of emergency response procedures. That's step one. Paul will show you in a second two things. He put the training handout up on the screen, if you can see that, and he'll show you the physical binder that we created as well. 
now that you have these tools, the second thing that we do is actually build into our training regime, training on how to use this, not specifically on every single emergency response procedure. Um, the binder is there, so it's a reference tool for everybody. Certain people who are tasked specifically, managers on duty, general managers, store managers, floor managers, they might want to be a lot more familiar with how to respond to very specific um, emergencies or how to use a fire panel or how to get where the main water shutoff is and things like that. Um, we build some of this into our trainings, our safety and security trainings that we deliver um, to all new employees. And then annually in a refresher training, we have built online training modules. We're gonna discuss that more actually if you join us next week, um, next Thursday on the 13th, we're gonna talk about and show a little bit about our training procedures. Um, again, we recommend if there's any updates that anybody in the know is, um, is made aware of those tr uh, updates. Paul is in a unique position where every year he'll vet these response procedures to make sure they're still relevant. Things like your service contract providers and things like that change. So he wants to make sure that everything's always up to date and any changes folks are made aware of. We put together a training handout specifically, just another way to train on the emergency response binder so that everybody gets this, they can kind of understand at least what it is physically. We use that binder also, as Paul will show you real quickly, as a place where we keep a lot of um, documentation forms as well that all employees may or you know, may need. Paul said we print like 10 to 15 of these. We put them throughout the store so that everyone has access to them. Paul, you can show the handout and you can also show the binder. I am trying to get back to my picture, but that's not going to be working very well. You still need to see my screen? All right, the handout's on the screen. Um, if you could see my screen, I have a copy of the binder here. Um, physical copy of it. You can see standard size, but you can see it's not very thick. It's just a half inch or a one inch binder. Um, it, the idea is to keep it very small, portable, uh, so you can have it in every department. It doesn't take up a whole lot of room per se. Um, and then in the front front covers, in the back cover, let's see if I can move that from the screen, we have uh, frequently used emergency or a uh, incident report form. So our employee injury report forms, our co-op incident report forms, uh, our, our security follow-up forms. Um, and then in the back cover, we have, uh, you know, foodborne illness, recall forms and things like that, all the documentation forms specific for that. Um, and as you're looking through the binder, everyone is kind of separated with its own little tab. And you have a collection of tabs here on the side so you can quickly find which, which code you need, which, which uh, emergency procedure you're looking for. You can quickly flip through that and then just read through your procedures. Um, we try to make it as simple as possible um, so that anybody can grab it and understand it. Um, it doesn't have to be a manager. Um, if you have a, a cashier that's stepping up and wants to be a leader during that emergency because uh, for whatever reason your customer service person is not able to, to do that, that's what this is for and it's going to help you identify some of those people as well and just for me to touch a little bit about on the training with over 300 employees three different locations um training modules are going to be really a key for for that having reg having standard training modules set up so that you can get um your employees to those uh, to accomplish them is going to be key. Um, you, every new employee should have should receive a, a bunch of standard training that not only is OSHA required, but also um, stuff for in reference to this. And then anybody you have tasked um, with responding to these emergencies, you may want to offer additional trainings. Um, and then on top of the initial trainings and the additional trainings, you do things like annual refreshers so that everybody understands those main things. Now, OSHA does require annual refresher training on certain topics, uh, but they don't require it on others, and you'd be remiss not to even bring it up, right? So for emergency evacuation, you know, why wouldn't I tell, remind everybody where our emergency, our emergency exits are? Or why wouldn't I remind everybody where our SDS binders are located, right? So those, those, um, those annual refreshers really become key in in our, our employees retaining that information. It's a lot of information, especially when you're starting a store brand new. Um, I guess. Um, we, divide, 
I mean, yes, I think that that probably covers most of the training. We're going to talk about training in more detail next week. So maybe some of you, I'm not sure, uh, will chime in with us then. Um, join us next week so we can you know, show you what we do. Training Paul mentioned in brief, but they're basically online training modules that we created. They're self-guided and they can be done on, a, on an iPad or a tablet so that you can, you can cover 300 employees without having to do 300 or however many presentations that would be. Um, but we include emergency response binder training. Again, not specific procedure training, except for a few things like fire and how to use a fire extinguisher, how to use paging codes. Some of the stuff you do find in the emergency response um, binder that's more universal is covered in these annual trainings. Uh, and some of the very mo much more specific stuff would be trained individually within departments. Um, and we do those as well. Again, when Paul sat down to figure his stuff out, you know, he put, put himself a, a list together. If a if flood was a threat or if a blizzard was a threat, he made a list of that and he worked his way through. So we have a simple system now that we work with clients on to help them do all this stuff to, um, so we can get it done for them in a much quicker time frame. Um, but basically that's what, that's the way we've approached it. We know that people do, you know, do it differently in each store. Uh, it's about 1.30, so we should probably like let folks go. We didn't want to keep you very longer, uh, much longer than we needed to. If anybody has a question, you know, we're willing to hang out for a few minutes and chat with you um, or individually. So you can send us a chat, you can chime in. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us how that sounded, what things looked like to you. If you have any Yeah, questions. what do you guys have? What do you guys use? Um, do you think something like this would be beneficial for your store? Do you think it won't be beneficial for your store? Anything. If not, hopefully you'll join us next week. And the following week, on the 20th, just as a reminder, um, this emergency response binder, the procedures, safety trainings, security trainings, the documentation and incident reports Paul was talking about are all part of what we call the Global Loss Prevention Program. Um, and we're going to be digging into that into a little bit more detail on the 20th. All of these things are a small part of what that larger program looks like to prevent loss, whether from theft, fraud, shoplifting, accidents, um, lost time, all those things. So we're going to be digging into that a little bit more uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying with the with the updating. It's actually not that bad. When I have to update, um, the, the hard part is getting them originally, right? So I'm making about 15 of these binders at once, but that's it. Um, afterwards, you know, I've updated the uh, power failure one, and I've updated um, workplace violence and some of the, obviously, the contact ones pretty regularly. And all I do is update it. I, I print out 16 copies and I just walk each binder. I have I have a, a list of all the locations for each of the binders. Um, and so I know just to just to walk through all of those and slip them in, recycle the rest. Um, it, it really isn't that bad. Um, and sometimes I'll ask another employee to do it because then that helps them learn the locations and they can help talk to the people in the area about what they're doing. So, and those folks also have the responsibility then of of going by and just auditing the binders themselves to make sure A, they're still in good shape. Paul showed you all of the individual procedures are in plastic page protectors so that things stay in good shape. And also to make sure all the documentation forms are in there. Things like security follow-up forms are gonna be used fairly frequently if that becomes part of your loss prevention program. So you wanna make sure that when they go to it, they can find those things there. You always keep backups, let's say somewhere at like your front end or uh, uh, what a customer service, but you know somebody running around and making sure those are good on a regular, fairly regular basis. Yeah, I mean you can roll that right into when you're doing your first aid kit updates. Um, should be checking those fairly regularly, once a month at least. Um, so you can roll that right in. Just open the binder in the location and just make sure you got all the forms that you need. If you need any extras, print it out. I, I put I have a you know a, a shared folder on the shared drive that everybody can access with all the PDFs of all the forms. So if the front end folks realize that they're out of um, customer injury report forms, they can just print those out um, and put them in the binders to, as well. Paul is in a unique position at his store where he uh, has built these systems and is responsible for maintaining a lot of them. But he's also charged with training a handful of folks to do that stuff as well. 
we all know that we've gone to a first aid kit in your own home or at, or at work and found no band-aids left. And the last time it was checked, you know, was a year or two ago. Again, Paul has built, we recommend systems where these things and audits are done much more regularly, not just of first aid kits. Obviously every year you have to have your fire extinguishers checked, emergency lighting needs to be checked, emergency flashlights need to be checked, emergency response binders need to be checked. So we like to find somebody in the store who then is tasked with these responsibilities, um, maybe works with us to get some of this stuff in place to get started. Once it's in place, just becomes part of your annual routine. You know, it's not, it's not a really big deal once it's in place. And again, ideally, you're not going to this stuff very often. The more training there is, hopefully, the less injuries you have to deal with. Um, the more on top of stuff you, you are, if you have a safety committee, maybe they're helping you identify things before they happen. So all the more reason to sort of think globally like we do as part of our whole safety and security package, put everything together so that you're actually responding before any, you actually have to respond. Looks like we've lost a couple folks. There's still a few folks hanging out with us. If anyone else has a question, just let us know. Or you can find our contact information um, probably on the website for sure at columinate.coop um, or look for us at powerplay.com. So we'd love to hear more from you. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Eric. I don't know how to stop the meeting. Oh, leave the meeting.